Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right, welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. I am here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Sucheta is about to have her second conversation with Dr. Judy Woolman. But before we go there, we're going to talk about a gentleman named Peter Rahal, who's actually from my neck of the woods here in Chicago, who is the founder of the RX Bar. Yes, Todd, I am going to talk about Peter Rahal and his story. So if you're a parent, teacher, psychologist, or an SLP like me, and you heard someone say, school was hell for me. I grew up thinking I was stupid. How would you feel? And that's what Peter Rahal, the founder of RX Bar, whose company is now worth $600 million, has said about his childhood experiences. And that breaks my heart. You know, school was never easy for Peter. Noticing his struggles early on in elementary school, uh, Peter's mother took him to a psychologist and he was diagnosed with a severe case of dyslexia. I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I didn't come across anything that describes what treatment or intervention he received. But it goes on, you know, all the readings and his interviews I, I saw, I heard him say that he compensated for the lack of success in the classroom uh, with his talent for sports. And, and in fact, by taking risks and uh, being dashing and bold. Interestingly, you know, later on, his own father, Norman Rahal, uh, in his 50s, discovered that he too had dyslexia, but was never diagnosed. So college journey, you know, was also not very easy for Peter. He did not get in his first choice, uh, Denison University, in spite of being a legacy there. And he was left to then go with the next choice. I think he went to Wittenberg, which also was a liberal arts college in the same state, which is Ohio. And the article that I read in Chicago Magazine, the author uh, writes that it forced him you know, it forced him to make it on his own. And he, Rahal found that his dyslexia actually gave him some advantages. At the top of the list, he is self-aware. So I think one of the interesting things that Peter talked about uh, in many of his interviews is that because school was challenged and because he never had success or ease with which he learned, he considered himself stupid. And that considering himself stupid was always a, a record that played in his head. And any failure that come, came his way became a failure that he met with two mindsets, I think. One is to fight it and uh, rebel against it, or just have this uh, negative record play in his head. After college, he tried to job, tried to make it out there. He wasn't successful. He came back. What uh, strikes me about his story that his, he had undying passion and a desire to make something and make a difference. And that's what I found that he channeled it and landed up putting together this uh, incredibly you know, innovative uh, product, which was a bar, a healthy bar uh, that was not existent. And he offered it uh, to uh, a fitness uh, club that he used to go. And from there on, his journey began. All I'm trying to say is we have people who look back at their lives and they are they've described being in classrooms and they were not understood or they had failures and they describe those failures to have a long lasting impact. And uh, the story ends there. They just don't seem to have even the diagnosis, for example, for Peter of dyslexia did not lead to have a successful understanding of self. So how do we change that? How do we bring a sense of ease and comfort in spite of challenges you experience? How do we provide information? How do we empower students with the right information about the nature of their own brain and its functioning and its uh, capacity for learning? And in what ways can we modify curriculum so that everybody gets a chance to learn? And that's what we are going to talk about. We're going to talk to Judy again. This is my second episode with Judy. And here's a little background about Judy. Judy Wallman is a psychologist in Sandy Springs area, which is here in Atlanta. She specializes in psychoeducational evaluation, family therapy regarding child-related issues, and psychotherapy for children and adolescents. 
She received her PhD in developmental school psychology in Georgia, from Georgia State in December of 1984. Prior to that, she received her master's in learning disabilities, and she has a bachelor of science in special education and elementary education from University of Maryland. Judy has been in practice in this area. In fact, her building is uh, uh, right uh, next to mine uh, for almost 30 years. She was previously with DeKalb County School System for 10 years as a school psychologist, as part of a preschool assessment team, and as a learning disability resource room teacher. Judy is often invited to speak to many schools and community groups on topics such as behavioral management of preschool and elementary age children, living happily with a pre-adolescent, building self-esteem, identifying attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and learning disabilities, and other topics related to successful parenting. She is an actively involved member of many professional organizations. She is married and has two grown-up children, and in fact, she is a proud grandmother as well. And it's um, my personal connection, as I mentioned in my earlier episode, uh, is she has been a one of my ardent uh, referral sources. She has referred a lot of clients to me, and I have referred them back. We have a collegial relationship and a friendship uh, that's uh, I have tremendous respect for the work she does and her deep understanding of complexities of uh, learning and educational uh, demands that collectively formulate a child's journey into uh, their educational life. And she is an integral part of that. And I'm very, very happy to know her as a friend. Yeah, well, and uh, since last week's conversation with Judy, I have been very much looking forward to today's conversation. So let's get to it. Here is Sujeda's second conversation with Dr. Judy Woolman. Welcome back, Judy. It's such a delight to have you. Let me start with this question. In your experience, you know, what are some of the roadblocks in learning and teaching that have become self-evident in 21st century? So I think that sometimes parents are hoping that teachers are going to handle the whole educational part of their child's life. And I think it's just very important for parents to remain very active in the education of their child so that they can advocate for their child. Sometimes within the school system, there is a perspective that you can't test a child when they're young because you won't be able to diagnose a learning disability. And I actually spent 10 years in the school system and now I've been in private practice for a very long time. But I do know I have a foot in both both worlds. And because the services that are offered in the public schools are federal dollars, those services are held for students who have a moderate to severe issue. And so children with mild issues don't get that intervention. And they'll be doing things in the classroom to do some modifications in the classroom, but they're not going to pull a child out for special education services until it's moderate to severe. But as a parent, we're concerned if our child's issues are mild and we want to get working on those those issues. We don't want to wait until they become bigger issues. So often in the school system, they will wait to test a child formally, first of all, until they've tried things on what they call the tier system, where they put the child through a process of some interventions. But it, time's going by. And what we now know is that if we get going earlier and intervene sooner when the problem is smaller, they may not qualify for public assistance, but they certainly can respond to private tutoring and maybe we can make the issue go away sooner. So I always have to, to say to parents, if your gut says to you that your child's not reading well and you see frustration, trust that parent gut and go ahead if you can possibly manage it and get testing for your child to find out what's really going on. And does that mean that, like you mentioned, you know, mild problems don't get uh, attention because they're more severe Children with severe disabilities, severe roadblocks have uh, greater needs, and so they get more, more attention or it's self-evident. Uh, does mild problem, uh, because often in my practice, what I see is people come from two schools of thought. One is kids will get over it or they will eventually mm -hmm. catch up because it's just their kids, they're learning, so why bother? Or second is the mild uh, signs are not creating formal roadblocks in learning. They are just uh, oopsies and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of like uh, faux pas. 
And uh, if you kind of look back, that's why, you know, uh, earlier you said that you we take a detailed history. The history is very evident about these problems starting as young as three years old, you know. Right. So somehow somebody kind of ignores them. Well, what are your thoughts about how, how should one think about these problems? Yeah, when is a good time to start doing something about child's difficulties? Yeah, I'm I'm a real proponent and sooner is better. You know, I was getting my hair done the other day and the hair stylist was talking about um, you know, grandchild and said that this grandchild does not have many words at age two. And I quickly Googled and I said, This is how many words there should be at age two and the person was like sort of shocked and said, Well, they are nowhere <laughs> near that and I said, you know, there's programs like Babies Can't Wait and you can get over, you know, this was uh, the person did not have a lot of funding, but you can get over to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and, you know, they're not going to turn around, a, a, turn away a child that needs that assessment. So I'm a big proponent and please don't wait, please get going. If there's any little concern in your gut that something's not right, don't just take one person saying it's fine. Go ahead and be very sure that you've done what you need to do because we can really make a difference if we get involved with kids in remediation early. So when you look at a child and uh, you evaluate their complaints, so to speak, do you then pull out certain test battery uh, or tests that are more appropriate? Or does every child who comes for this kind of evaluation gets a standardized uh, selection of test so material? It, it does vary depending on the issue. There are certain things that are standard. So every assessment is going to have a measure of cognitive or intellectual functioning. And every battery is going to have a measure of reading and math and spelling and writing. But for example, if I'm working with a youngster and I begin to question that there may be dyslexia and they're, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I'm going to want a very robust measure of their oral reading fluency and accuracy. In contrast, if I'm working with a youngster and their reading is great and that's not the issue, I'm going to spend my time on on the issue whether it's more writing or more math, or perhaps it's going to be a child where sometimes it's social emotional. I'm going to spend more of the time in that area or more of the time on attention concentration tasks. So we we start with some of the same critical pieces, but then we start taking avenues that look further at the area that is starting to be the area of concern. So quickly, can you tell us if somebody's having social emotional challenges or have have early signs of Asperger's or autism, is there a test that they will receive? Yes. So Hello? that would be one of the things I would try to grasp in terms of the original phone contact. And if I'm beginning to hear that there are some concerns in those areas, there are specific tests. There's one called the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation System. I'm actually not skilled to give it, but there is someone else in the practice who is. And I'm going to probably direct that referral to that person. Or if the referral comes in and it's someone where it's an older student and there's a sense that that social emotional functioning is the issue, not spectrum, but anxiety, depression, I'm going to sort of shift that referral again to the person in the practice who is more skilled with projective testing. So part of the important piece is that initial phone call which is, it's interesting. I actually make all of my own return phone calls. Been doing that my whole professional career. And wow. part of the reason is I feel like on that phone contact, I am getting a lot of information and giving a lot of information that needs to be expressed before the testing to make good decisions for that child. So I just, you know, sometimes somebody will say, why are you spending all that time on the phone? It's like, I, I just think it makes a difference in what I do. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And so it sounds like this logic will also apply to those kids who have who are showing tendencies towards uh, giftedness. And so you will spe- mm-hmm. do some specialized evaluation for that as well? Yes. And being attuned, sometimes highly gifted children can look quirky. You know, we sometimes think, oh, how lucky to be highly gifted. But I always say to the parents of those kids, remember that when a child is too three standard deviations above the mean, we do so much focus on children who are two and three standard deviations below the mean, who are below a 70 IQ, but we kind of think, oh, how lucky for the child that's a 130 or 145 IQ, but they really do sometimes struggle because they don't necessarily easily find a peer that has some of the same interests. 
they are sometimes crawling out of their skin when they have to sit through (laughs) very mundane instruction. Sometimes they want to only do the interesting things, but they do have to do. You do have to sit and learn to form the letters, and you do have to sit and work on some of the basics, you know, phonics, even though you can read, you still need to know a few of the phonics rules so that there's some underpinning to that natural ability. And so sometimes being a highly gifted child is is very tough. I always try to educate parents, get them to read some things on highly gifted children. I'll tell you what's really tough to distinguish is with highly gifted kids, there's something called hyper excitabilities. They're you know, I've had some of these kids flipping cartwheels while we're doing therapy practically. <laughs> and how to separate that from what's ADHD is really tough. And it sometimes takes a little while of really watching it play out because they're busy, but sometimes they're busy because their brain is going in a productive way rapidly, not in a aimless sort of distractible way. Got it. So one more question regarding testing. So any... Uh, Why do I find that uh, many students who have had previously been evaluated have not received any measures of executive function as part of their test battery? So they academically, they look fine, but their complaints have been in the area of executive proficiency. And that doesn't give any information to the parents or the child or to the teacher. So it looks like he doesn't have a challenge, but he has executive dysfunction when I evaluate them. Interesting. You know, it's there in everything that people are doing, but it's a matter of sometimes looking at not the product, not the number, but the process that the student went through to be able to say, you know, I see some difficulty inhibiting impulses, or I see some lack of flexibility, or I see, you know, that they're disorganized in the way they do a task. So it's all there in, I think, the testing that's being done but I think you have to be attuned to what you're looking for. It's interesting. There are many people that don't diagnose dyslexia because they don't know. You know there's this there's this sort of fallacy that you know you can't do it in the public schools. That it's not. I don't know. I call it the D word. But there are a lot of states now. There's a lot of federal focus, and states are beginning to make sure that that is in fact in the state regulations. Our state right now in Georgia is working very hard to get that word in the material about special education. So same with executive functioning is you've got to know what it is to be able to call it. So sometimes it's in the test results, just like dyslexia is in the test results, but no one knew to call it that. So then the parent isn't getting that information. So that brings me to this question that typically those who are not familiar with the report from a, a, a you know a clinical psychologist or educational psychologist is maybe 16 to 18 pages long. It is dense with amazing, fabulous information. Uh, 25 but, to 30 pages long. Oh, 25 <laughs> to 30, yes. I was just being a very, very modest. Okay. Uh, and people don't know what to do with it. So yeah, what yeah. is your expectation when you provide a report What's the best way to utilize your, uh, uh, your what you have captured? Uh, and what advice do you have as to how to read this Parents. report? So hopefully the conference, which is so important, will help parents really understand what all those numbers mean. It's still kind of overwhelming because there's a lot. And while they're sitting in that conference, I remember even as a mother, the first time the pediatrician said your child has an ear infection, I went into like, you know, non-functioning status. <laughs> So I know that it's stressful. What I say to parents is, please feel comfortable to make a list of questions once you've been through the conference and then you've read the report and it's like something's not making sense. They need to be able to feel like that document is for them. We don't want it to be a document that just goes and sits in a file somewhere and doesn't do anything productive. And hopefully at the end of every psychologist's report are some very clear bulleted recommendations and diagnoses so that it is very clear that they could almost go through that last part of a report and speak with teachers and talk about what it is that they that they've been told that their child needs and make it a working document not just something that kind of gets filed i love it i'll tell you a story you'll get a kick out of this i i saw a young man after he bombed uh, his sophomore year, and then he was eventually referred to me. And when I started talking with him, apparently his first uh, neuropsychological evaluation was done when he was in third grade. And by the time he came to see me, he had six 
or to seven evaluations, but he had not read a single one right. uh, because he was never made aware of it. Right. And that's kind of, to me, is a terrible disservice. Yeah. So what's you, what's a good golden I, rule? <laughs> you know what? When children are in high school, I actually have the conference with them and I have the parents function as the peanut gallery. So I, I literally even structure it so that the student is sitting to my side going through the results and I focus on them, but I'll kind of, you know, include the parents. So to me, high school, they've got to have the data. So that the, and I say to them, the purpose of this is not to bore you to death. It's so that you can learn what you need to do to self-advocate with your teachers and let them know how you learn and what you need. Middle schoolers, I will sometimes have parents say, after I've had the parent through the conference, I'd love for my student to get this information. I will absolutely have them back in for a short session and go through it with them in a less detailed way. The younger kids, I have kind of counted on the parents to you know, pass it forward with their children in terms of what they need. But I would be open to having any child come in and just bring it down to their level in terms of how they learn. Some kids need to know you learn so well by writing information on paper. And no, the laptop computer doesn't seem to quite do it the same as writing it on paper. Or you learn by really repeating this information inside your head again and again and again. And Sometimes students need to move around the room and talk to themselves while they're putting that information into their mind. So I think it's really helpful to help them understand their best way to learn. You know, you're basically talking about best practices. You know, every clinician should be really living by this golden standard, I feel. And sometimes I don't know what the reasons are, but some people are held back and not comfortable. Mm -hmm. So this brings me to two important questions is one, I have met so many uh, and, you know, you and I live in Atlanta and we are familiar with the culture of private schools here. But I meet with a lot of parents who are extremely afraid of disinformation getting out. So they yeah. almost become the gatekeeper of this information. And I'm always discouraging them. And I remind them that this is a partnership with your school. What are the reasons that you see that parents are hesitant to share this important, valuable information about the child's uh, right. learning profile? I think some people are fearful that their child is going to be labeled. But as I always say to them, you know what, without the document, your child who is struggling in a certain area of school is actually already labeled. Everyone really knows. And isn't it better if we give them the right information and we give them some direction on what to do about it instead of sticking it into a, a locked file somewhere away from the school, not wanting them to have that information. And I have to say that if you're in a place where you can't trust the people that are working with your child to educate them, you're not in the right place. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, I just think it's critical to be, I think you're right, to be a team together. And however, I always say to the parents, it is a very private document and you have the right to say to your school, tell me where this document goes, who has access to it, how is it kept private, because it shouldn't be sitting on a teacher's desk, it should be in a locked file, it should be a situation where the teacher goes to a set place to sit and look at it. Many of the schools, what I've observed have a point person who reads it thoroughly, reads the document thoroughly, and then puts together a sort of a working document for the teachers. So that's the piece that's floating around, not the full psychoeducational evaluation. And I think that's a, I think that's a wise way to handle it. I just love that. I think uh, that's such an empowering way you're educating them to, you know, extend that partnership. But also it's becoming more informed about the process, you know, and these processes, you don't you don't get any manual for parenting and particularly parenting no. a child with any special needs. You know, another question I have about recommendations, one of the my pet peeves and tell me what do you think about this recommendation is extended time. But I'm only referring that uh, in the context of uh, children with executive dysfunction who have ADHD, who don't have any learning disability or language-based learning disability or dyslexia. And they are given this extended time, which under the umbrella that the child will actually take advantage of the extended time wow. and use that extended time to not get distracted, but to read and process information more carefully. And it never works. And it just, I think there's a lot of problem in implementation of this suggestion. How, what is the logic uh, that the psychologists have behind giving extended time? So when there's a learning disability, 
And especially when a student has received some remediation and they're trying to use those remedial strategies, the extended time can be tremendous assistance for them. And I always say that it, it, it doesn't help. Extended time does not help a student who does not have a learning disability. They're just sitting there for longer. But if the student is really got a dyslexic profile, of, for example, or some sort of a language learning disability, that extra time results in a completely different set of scores. And I always, parents are sometimes nervous about extended time. And I go, listen, at Harvard, people who are learning disabled have extended time. And they are probably people who are going to make huge discoveries and make our world a better place. I, I want them to be able to show what they know. And they may end up working at their lab if they end up going into something in science. They may be there till midnight because they work slower, but they might discover the cure to cancer. So that's where extended time is exactly what the student needs. There are students who, you know, it's not that they work slowly. And in fact, they are flying through things. And so sitting there twice as long just makes them crawl the wall. And it, it is not the right intervention. We have to help them to, to learn to be more thoughtful and more reflective. Their strategy is different than just sitting in the room for twice as much time. But if it's the, if it's the right accommodation for a student, it totally will transform the information that we get. Yeah, and I think the, I I don't know if this is a common dilemma of uh, parents wanting extended time, and psychologist mm. is like, okay, fine, I, I can see that having a value. Uh, I find a disconnect between the student not really recognizing how to utilize that extended time for self. My other question was some of these, um, and again, I'm using executive function as a lens. Some of the recommendations that I see is um, when you have a student with difficulty uh, in connecting to, uh, you know, m m organizing or managing themselves, a lot of psychological uh, recommendations are on paper that require implementational coaching or implementational process, but that they don't receive it because that's not the purpose of the evaluative process. So for example, if the psychologist recommends that, you know, um, break, uh, take notes in the class or prepare a study guide for yourself or mm -hmm. one of the uh, results, I mean, a report I'm reading that, you know, have uh, John create a mental image uh, or visualization about the information to be learned. It's a great suggestion, but it doesn't, uh, the student doesn't know how to. They're going to need and a sometimes, coach. Yeah. 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 So coach. what, what is one to do with this kind of recommendation? And I'm assuming psychologist, as you said, has provided that information during the intake. I mean, during that, sure. uh, you know, end I, of exit I would, interview. I would hope that if there is a recommendation that is not something a student is going to be able to implement on their own, that there needs to be a professional recommended to that student who is going to be able to teach them how to do it. You know, because it can be a wonderful strategy, but somebody's going to have to teach them how to do that just the way we teach reading, math, spelling, writing. It's not something that you can just say, oh, do this. They would have done it if they could have figured out how to do it on their own. So you've got to find some personnel to implement with the student. Yeah, and I, I just find, uh, again, you know, some of these uh, poor practices that parents even are involved with or uh, they, they, they take the child to the psychologist, they get the report, they give it to the school, and they hope that the accommodations are put in place, but right. they kind of glaze over the rest of the accommodations, which is that process-specific learning, and they never go to the right person to receive right. that coaching, which is kind of... I, it's such I a think we <laughs> need more people. I mean, I can't tell you how often during the week people say... You know, I'd love somebody to work on executive functioning. And you know, I mean, how many people can you serve? You know, it's it's we yes. need, we need more people coming out trained in that field. I think it's it's an and not just children. We have adults who need that support too. So, how do you see in closing uh, the work that I do has complemented the work you do? What, as you just mentioned, you know, there's such a need to teach this. In what ways you have seen that work for? students to develop these abilities outside the classroom or outside the edu formal educational learning? I think we need more of it. First of all, I think, you know, and you've done some of this too, I think we need to educate teachers on how to implement executive function, organizational strategy, teaching explicitly in the classroom. You know, there are some teachers that know how to explicitly teach, you know, something that requires organization, like say writing a term paper, and they'll do it in very broken down pieces. But there are others that really haven't learned how to teach that very explicitly. And I, so I think, number one, we need to get educators to, to know how to implement that. 
And then I think we need support people out there that parents can call upon when a child's struggling to not, I say it's not give the fish, but to teach the child how to fish. That's the Mm. important piece so that they can go forward in life with the strategy, with the skill and be independent. Well, thank you, Judy, so much for what you do and the way you have explained. And I really appreciate uh, our friendship. And it's been such a joy to have collaborated with you for over 17 years now. Wow. <laughs> just that's can't a believe long it. time. That's a long and, time to say that. And, and truly, uh, I'm so grateful for your time. And it's been phenomenal to talk with you. Oh, it's a pleasure. I wish I just want more of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thanks. And have a fabulous day. You too. Bye-bye. All right, that was Dr. Judy Woolman. Yet another great conversation with her, Sucheta. Kick us off with some initial thoughts, please. Yeah, so this kind of conversation reminds me about uh, going back to the bigger picture. What is the 21st century education expect from our children? You know, we are expecting children to manage their learning, and they are not required to just memorize things anymore because you can Google it. But what they need to do is, in fact, manage them themselves. They need to self-regulate. They need to kind of find assignments online. They need to uh, make sure that they are ready for soccer practice. They need to, they are highly uh, booked, highly intensely engaged children with so much demand on their time that they need to effectively process information, organize information, and produce all that they need to produce in a timely way. And if we keep that at a, um, at the heart of uh, learning expectations, then we need to really uh, kind of contextualize what the learning difficulties may look like. So the teachers are handling the education of a child and the parents are also supporting it. So collectively, there needs to be great advocacy and a a relationship built between teachers and parents uh, that kind of uh, speaks the same language and is on the same page. Another thing comes to my mind is for milder disabilities, as Judy was mentioning, the federal dollars are held for children with severe disabilities. And those who are uh, doing poorly, but their um, their poor performance is obvious. They are they're failing. They they're having devastating uh, academic outcome, and or they behaviorally are disruptive so much so that they they are more stand out. Um, so such students may be getting a direct and specific uh, identification. But how about the children that with milder issues? And I don't mean. The issues are um, negligible, but the issues are more invisible. They are likely to not get the help readily because the skills gap is not evident yet. And also, particularly the the clientele or the population I serve, which is executive dysfunction, their mismanagement can often be misinterpreted as intentional mismanagement or lack of commitment uh, is considered a a trait, a behavioral trait rather than, which is a personality trait rather than a skill. And if you have that framework, then those children are less likely to receive any support or diagnosis. So that leads me to believe that there's a great disadvantage that's created for those students who are smart, capable, but are scattered. And those whose smarts has allowed them to circumvent some lear- learning challenges when they were younger, but suddenly become less effective in their own performance. And so such students are not likely to be on the radar. And that's why we need strong uh, psychoeducational and uh, neuropsychological tests uh, done uh, that can identify these subtle nuances of a child's performance. All right. So when a parent receives that comprehensive psychoeducational report on their child, what, what do they do with that? Yeah, so that's a great question, isn't it? So, uh, you know, we spent last weeks talking a lot about these complex tests uh, that uh, give you lots of findings. But if you ever have taken a look at this psychoeducational or neuropsychological report, they are like almost 13 to 20 pages. And there is a description of the battery of tests that have been used. And yes, it takes, uh, uh, you know, almost half a day to decipher uh, or go through that entire report. So, Let's go back to the beginning. A child enters an educational psychologist or neuropsychologist office because there's a barrier in learning and the findings uh, that, that they have discovered unfold the student's learning profile that can help guide future decisions about many things, particularly school placement, 
remediation, accommodation, and any additional suggestions. So parents need to take the time to read the entire neuropsychological test. They should actually get into a habit of uh, discussing with their psychologist and saying, can you give me a condensed version, a one-page summary that I can share with my child and my teachers? Parents also need to take um, a kind of shift their mindset a little bit. I find that particularly uh, in private school, parents are very concerned that they don't want to share the full report because they believe that will influence the teacher one way or the other, or the teacher may actually begin to expect less from my child or will have less respect for my child because now they are uh, they have clear evidence of what's wrong with my child. And I de- beg to defer because I feel that Teachers have already noticed a lot of these things, so they don't need the formal report as much as the formal report confirms uh, their observations and gives them a, a proper guidelines as to what is a true inability, what is a true disability, and what is an ability that is under uh, accentuated. So that kind of differentiation can be really helpful. Most psychologists will re- uh, review the report in person and uh, explain uh, many times, explain uh, to adolescent. Uh, and, and of course, you need a little bit of intellectual maturity to understand this. So I, I'm not saying that uh, you should be explaining to, to a six-year-old, but a, a good psycholo- psychologist with a great practice of um, kind of simplifying the message can do that really well. And uh, finally, I think the psychologists are experts in assessing and recommending how to create the best environment where the child will thrive. So uh, one should take that suggestion seriously. All right. So the the psychoeducational reports that these psychologists provide, I mean, they they provide a lot of different information on school placement, remediation, accommodations, amongst other things, I suspect. Can you walk us through some of these, please? Yeah, and I, I think this is the advantage of doing the takeaways, right? I get to elaborate on what Judy was talking about. And and so let's start with the what are the really psychologist experts at they are, they, uh, that the school placement. So if a child is experiencing barriers in learning, then the immediate concern is, is my child in the right environment? Here are some thoughts about the school placement that the psychologists are able to shed light on. Educational psychologists are experts in school placement as they understand the child and the right environment that proves to be most uh, nurturing. And they also uh, are community experts. So they know, like, for example, Judy knows so many or most of the private schools in the metro Atlanta area. And she has uh, incredible experience with public schools. So she also knows many public schools in the c- a couple of counties that we cover. So the parents need to engage in the discussion as um, they carefully consider the right placement based on the recommendations they receive. For example, after reading the report, when parents begin to consider various options, I encourage the parents to explore the school settings. For example, I will say, you know, look at the school that you're looking at, um, considering and what is the class size? You know, what's the student to teacher ratio? Does the class allow or facilitate experiential approach? If the child is diagnosed with dyslexia, for example, does the school uh, provide highly structured and systematic instruction in reading and spelling? So we don't we don't want just uh, a great ratio, but no specific instructioning in uh, learning uh, the skill set that uh, compensate for um, learning disability because of dyslexia. So and another question to think about is, uh, does it offer any type of curriculum uh, along with the uh, support services that the child receives? So these are some considerations for school placement. The second thing you talked about was the remedial services. The report reveals if there is any some sort of skills gap, and then it uh, recommends specific remedial services that can bring the skill set at par with the peers where the child is going to operate. So psychologists recommend something like a reading or written language instruction that can be done uh, uh, from outside support. You know, the student, uh, if the student needs a specific multisensory phonetic approach, then the, the psychologist may say that, you know, why don't you explore Linda Mood Bell or Orton Gillingham or Wilson Method? Um, if the student needs explicit systematic instruction in sound spelling correspondence that uh, complements decoding instruction, then the psychologist would outline that. And the psychologist not only just uh, is giving these specific types of treatment, but they may give a list of recommended people who provide that as well. So that's the advantage of uh, getting some specific recommendations about the remedial services. The next thing was accommodation. So this is an important change that the parents need to understand that, that the 
remediation versus modification are two different things. So accommodation is to create an environment which will foster the performance of the child, but that is not a skill building necessarily. So for example, using a word processor will be a great tool for the child. You know, there are certain schools that are very strict, particularly public schools, that they don't allow laptops during uh, test taking. But if you, if the child has specific accommodation, then he can be allowed uh, to use a laptop for typing his papers or answers. An alpha smart keyboard is a simple and relatively inexpensive writing tool uh, that can be a great uh, support for keyboarding that uh, can be useful for a child uh, also. There are certain things such as speech recognition software can be useful um, as the child goes through written work and particularly kind of circumvent the transcription problem that the child often uh, runs into. Uh, you know, providing a child uh, books on tape can be a great uh, modification or accommodation. The books on tape um, can be a great uh, compensation for that child who has tremendous uh, struggles with uh, because of dyslexia and their reading rate may be slow. So that's the kind of modification or accommodation that we can talk about. And the final thing, uh, the additional services that the psycholo- psychologist looks at the bigger picture. So they're not just focused on learning, but what kind of uh, mindset the child has, what kind of uh, social emotional adjustment barriers that these learning problems can create? How does the child relate to his peers? So the psychologist may recommend outside tutor for consistent tutoring at home if the parents are not able to provide or parents and child are running into some conflict because of the way the child thinks the parents are, uh, you know, um, making suggestions about how to study. There can be some things such as, you know, OT console for fine motor, uh, for pencil grip or for things uh, that can help in uh, uh, motor planning that can be improved. Or finally, uh, because of the anxiety, isolation and distress the child is feeling, uh, the uh, psychologist can also recommend therapeutic uh, process uh, um, and give recommendations with counselors that can uh, help remediate that. So this kind of report is really, really uh, helpful in understanding the big picture of um, how to go about, you know, handling uh, the identified problems. Yeah, but as you said earlier, I mean, this is this is a comprehensive report. Lots, lots there. It's important to be sure you have support and help to help you get through it and understand how to implement all this. Because, uh, you know, if you don't, well, then... You're not making any improvements there. Uh, it's a lot to think about. Good stuff. So any final thoughts before we wrap this uh, this week's conversation? Yes, Todd. Thank you so much for asking that. You know, problems are omnipresent and inevitable part of living a full life. Seeing a struggling child or a struggling adult is no picnic. How one moves ahead from there is a real test of personal perseverance. We have come from times uh, or an era where people were expected to pull themselves by the bootstraps. And having challenges was a private and personal matter that in, induced shame or fear. Uh, things are better uh, now, and they're supposed to get even better. We have, have neuropsychologists, clinical psychologists, and educational psychologists offering their expertise. The analysis they provide can be of great asset to guide educational decisions and specific and targeted interventions. However, uh, we must be aware of few systemic challenges. These services are not available to all. In private schools, you have to pay out of pocket and get it done. In public schools, there's there are protocols and wait time. You know, they are expensive and require time and eventually may lead to the discovery that there is a lot of work to be done and more expenses are uh, involved. And so people's logical brain may want, but their emotional side may, may prefer not to know. So that's the tricky balance that one one has to strike. So having information, uh, a a report or a diagnosis is a start and not the end. That's what I would uh, recommend to everybody to be thinking about. Mm, Good stuff. Good, good stuff. All right. It's all the time we have for today. On behalf of our host, Sujeta Kamath, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at cerebralmatters.com. That's cerebralmatters.com. 
Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.